Hi, everyone. So we're going to get started. I, we have a lot of great speakers today, and I want to make sure we have enough time for them to share their wisdom and also for you to ask questions. So there is going to be Q&A at the end of the fireside chat as well at the, at the end of our panel that follows. So if you have questions, hold on, and we will pass around a mic so you can ask. Uh, we will not be live streaming today's event. We are having technical difficulties at the Open Technology Institute, but it will be recorded and available on our website later. So hello everyone and welcome to New America. Thank you so much for coming to today's event. I hope that you all got some lunch and you are ready to hear from our guests. Uh, my name is Andy <coughs> and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Open Technology Institute. OTI has been deeply involved in the fight to protect strong encryption as well as the fight to ensure consumer privacy in all technologies. Both of these vibrant debates are taking place on a variety of fronts and we are happy that we are able to bring together experts from the various important stakeholders in this event. Encryption is crucial to protect the privacy and security of everyone who uses the internet, including individuals, companies, and governments. It allows us to do things like safely file taxes, conduct internet banking, shop on our favorite sites, exchange sensitive health information, and communicate online. <coughs> Many actors are part of the discussion surrounding encryption and consumer privacy. Today we have experts representing some of those constituencies, including regula uh, regulators like those at the Federal Trade Commission, companies, Congress, consumer protection organizations, and technologists who can help shed some light on these debates. I am thrilled to announce, introduce Commissioner Rohit Chopra from the Federal Trade Commission for our opening fireside chat. Commissioner Chopra was sworn in as a Federal Trade Commissioner on May 2, 2018. He has actively advocated to promote a fair and fully functioning marketplace through vigorous agency enforcement that protects families and honest companies from those who break the law. During his tenure at the FTC, he has pushed for aggressive remedies against lawbreaking companies, especially repeat offenders, and has worked to reverse the FTC's reliance on no money, no fault settlements. He holds a BA from Harvard University and an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He was also a recipient of the Fulbright Fellowship. Alexandra Levine, our moderator, is joining us to interview Commissioner Chopra, as well as moderate the panel that will follow this conversation. Alex is a reporter covering the intersection of technology, government, and public policy, and she is the author of Politico's popular <coughs> daily newsletter, Morning Tech, which I'm sure most of the people in this room see in their inboxes every morning. Thank you, Alex, and I'll turn this over to you. So much for being here on what is a crazy day and has been a crazy 24 hours. Um, so we have heard a lot about encryption lately from the Justice Department and the Commerce Department, but less so from the FTC. So how does the FTC's work fit into the encryption debate and how do you see your agency's potential role here? Sure. So, you know, I think there's a lot of views on encryption and where I come down on it is I totally get when law enforcers are frustrated that they can't always get the information they want uh, to decode the messages they want when they're doing investigations. But here's how I see it. I see encryption as hand in hand now with national security. If you think about all of the breaches, all of the interceptions of our personal data, increasingly they are coming from foreign state actors. Uh, the OPM hack, you know, the Secretary of State told us that Marriott was connected to China. Many of these are connected to China and other, others who wish to do our country harm maybe. And so I, I think it is short-sighted to believe that being able to, you know, have a backdoor into encrypted communications is going to make us safer. Here's what I think is going to happen. Criminals and crooks are going to use encrypted communication somewhere, and the rest of us could be left vulnerable. So a backdoor for, for law enforcement may be a backdoor for those who wish to do us harm. And I see the FTC's role as, in fact, much of the FTC's work is actually pushes to promote encryption. Our latest proposed rule, uh, the safeguards rule, talks about encryption. We said we've done enforcement actions that uh, when companies are lying about encryption. So I think what you're seeing is uh, a greater awareness that big companies in our country are mining massive amounts of data on us. 
Um, and people know who wish to do us harm that they can use that data against us to divide us and cause us harm. And we need to look at encryption as a way to safeguard against some of those risks. And how would you say that position might have evolved from the former FTC under Obama? Well, I don't, I can't speak for how that FTC thought about things. I think the more we've seen these major breaches, and of course, the Equifax breach, many of these breaches, I think, have been a reminder that this is not a mistake or this is not just a few people seeking maybe to steal someone's identity. This is a concerted effort, I think, by many institutions outside of the borders of our country often that are trying to do really what Facebook and Google are doing on all of us, creating detailed dossiers on each of us so that they can manipulate us or they can cause us harm. And so, you know, I, I, I think we are now, it used to be national security versus encryption. Now I just see encryption as hand in hand with, with us being safe and secure. So you've said already how the FTC cares a lot about data security and encryption, as you've said, is one way to really strengthen that. Um, I wanna talk about the DOJ's approach to this. Is the Trump administration taking the right approach in pointing to encryption as an example of tech malfeasance or a tool to protect bad actors? Well, again, I understand. I have been part of many investigations at, at several agencies where you get to look at the emails or the text messages and you can really see how criminals and bad actors are colluding. I get that. But again, I just wanna underscore this. If those bad actors will migrate to encrypted communication elsewhere, we have now seen in m many OECD countries, those countries promoting the use of encryption. In some cases, countries are making available uh, means to promote encryption. So I just don't see how we will figure this out where some where bad actors are just going to stay on these these uh, messaging services and other platforms that law enforcement can tap into. We already know that many of these criminals and bad actors are using the dark web, using ways to remain undetected. So to me, I see the balance as the criminals are always going to be able to get their hands on encrypted, uh, uh, you know, ways to use encrypted communications. And then what does that mean for the rest of the public who are using widely available commercial services? Are we then more of a target, um, again, to, for states to do, for foreign actors to do what Google and Facebook are doing to us, which is making us less secure by having boatloads of detailed information on us? So if the DOJ does get its way on weakening encryption, do you think that would create an, an environment that makes it harder uh, or that prevents tech companies from um, doing the things that currently the FTC expects them to do on the data security front? Well, to be clear, the FTC has not put into place economy-wide data security rules. Um, there has been enforcement actions, there's been particular rules that affect specific industries. But that's not something the FTC has done, and I think we should really think about doing that because we can't necessarily wait um, you know, for someone else to solve that problem for us. So look, I'm not sure what the DOJ's or, or any particular law enforcement agency's specific proposal is. If they are telling firms, we don't want you to create end-to-end -end encryption, again, what is the natural response going to be from others? who wish to do harm, they will just not use those channels. So again, I don't know if we have a full-fledged proposal. And in fact, if they, if, if they, we've gone through this debate 20 some years ago. We had the government propose the clipper chip. We went through all this. We saw from many individuals that there was vulnerabilities on it. We've heard proposals about you know, third-party custodians of encryption keys. We now see that that might become an even bigger target for hacking. So I'm not actually sure what the specific proposal is other than telling, the, telling certain firms to slow down on end-to-end -end encryption. And going beyond uh, the Justice Department, what is your feedback on the encryption debate happening on the Hill? Well, I think we're, it's probably recycling some older arguments and that it may not fully be taking into account how 
unencrypted communications may actually be a risk um, to the public. And look, I don't think, I think you're going to see a lot of big tech companies wanting to present them themselves as we're trying to protect consumers and the government is not, you know, we need to be very suspicious of these big tech companies' motives too. I am sure they are figuring out ways to monetize this and profit from it in their own way. I have my own concerns about what metadata is being collected. Even if the actual message is encrypted, what are they able to find out? So I don't think this is a bad, I'm sure there are many of them want to promote this image that they're the ones championing consumers when they are not disclosing fully all of the range of data that they are mining about us. And I want to come back to the, to the tech company piece of this um, in just a moment. Um, I also wanted to ask, though, do you see any court or legislative action on the horizon? Well, I mean, we've been hearing uh, about legislative action on privacy legislation for a while, and I haven't, you know, we, we're waiting and waiting. So I take, my point of view is, I think the regulators, we all need to do everything we can to make sure there is not mass surveillance in our society by big firms. We also need to make sure that data that does need to be transferred is protected. And again, you see regulator after regulator after regulator move toward encryption. You know, in health privacy, there's actually a, a safe harbor that you may not even need to disclose to patients if the intercepted data was encrypted. You see in financial services, there's a big push on all sorts of banking transactions to be fully encrypted. Even in the FTC's own proposed rule, there's a shift toward encryption in our sa proposed safeguards rule. So again, I think in some ways the train has left the station on moving more toward um, secure communications. And on the privacy legislation piece of this, um, if the government were, again, successful in its uh, demands to have tech companies weaken encryption, how do you think that would affect federal privacy legislation? And what sort of precedent do you think it might set for other consumer privacy concerns? Yeah, I'm not sure. I've thought about it a little bit more in terms of what precedent does it set for other governments around the world who point to the United States and use it as an excuse to potentially engage in deeper surveillance over their own citizens? So we've seen a lot of misuse of that information about what is the US's point of view. And for me, again, from a national security perspective, a human rights perspective, um, I think the U.S. actually should be promoting this um, in all global fora. And again, I just want to hit this over and over again. Bad actors will go and find methods to engage in encrypted communication. Um, returning to the tech company piece of this, I want to talk about Facebook. Um, so as the FTC is investigating Facebook, um, I'm <coughs> curious how you view the company's commitment to privacy. Um, is Facebook's pledge uh, Facebook's pledge to implement end-to-end -end, uh, end -end encryption across all of its platforms, do you think that is actually synonymous with protecting data? Because Facebook is doing this <coughs> in the face of a, a lot of criticism. Um, will this actually help Facebook build a reputation uh, as a company that cares a lot about privacy? Well, I think we have to start and just be honest with ourselves. Facebook clearly does not demonstrate loyalty to any particular country. I don't think we should consider Facebook you know, o owing special duties to us because we've seen they've been willing to violate the law, get caught violating the law, and then repeat repeatedly violate the law afterward with a very clear established order. And you know, the FTC's resolution in that matter, you know, they paid a fine, they'll do some, you know, things here and there. I don't think that, we, we everyone I think is converging that it is not clearly going to change the culture of that firm. We just saw another major enforcement action regarding Illinois' biometric law, another $550 million settlement. I'm not sure these monetary fines are going to fix some of the privacy issues with that firm. Um, and look, I, I, I look forward to seeing what they come up with. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure that the American public is going to really be able to trust them given this behavioral advertising business model that they have, that they will always have a thirst for more and more and more data. And you know, many people suspect that the reason they want to move to end-to-end -end encryption is because they have their own incentives of perhaps wanting to promote Libra or other sort of uh, digital currency. So we need to scrutinize carefully all of their motives because I think 
we have not seen a very good track record in terms of their, their uh, practices on privacy. So on balance, would you say the move to end-to-end -end encrypt on Facebook is better for individual security or worse for individual security? Well, I would love to, uh, obviously, I think generally, not Facebook in particular, but all messaging and communications that go, moves to end-to-end -end encryption, you know, consumers can get value out of it. We can protect ourselves more. Again, I want to know the details about how they plan to monetize that because depending on what other information they may be able to collect, you know, we can't really have a verdict on that. Um, with that, I want to open it up to questions. Yes. I think there's a mic coming around. Um, thanks so much for your clear uh, take on this. And I was wondering, so it seems like one of the fundamental issues is that um, <coughs> going back multiple rounds of this debate, um, clearly like some <coughs> people, uh, technical experts make the argument that it's not really possible to create a backdoor for good actors without also leaving it at least sort of cracked open for bad actors. And then people who, um, people find that hard to believe, you know, like it's, well, you're just sort of, appealing to this technical argument, you're just telling me that I just can't do this thing, but if it seems like it should be possible. So I was wondering if um, you know of any attempts to sort of demonstrate more technically that um, this is not possible, um, to sort of move the conversation forward, because it seems like there's a lot of people who, from my perspective, sort of have their heads in the sand about it and are unwilling to accept this technical reality. Well, look, I'm open to the idea always that if there are technological solutions to you know, issues we should evaluate them. I think what you hear from a lot of security researchers is that if there is a proposal on how that's, this would be done, it needs to be vetted by the security research community. And what they find with many of these proposals is that there are significant vulnerabilities. In fact, we saw, you know, Professor Matt Blaze at Georgetown, you know, I think over 20 years ago exposed some of these vulnerabilities with the government's clipper chip proposal. So again, I think we should be willing to have the debate, but uh, many of the proposals that have been put forward have been soundly demolished as exposing us to greater vulnerability. And again, I think it, we also heard this proposal some time ago about you know third-party custodians of keys. Isn't that just going to make them a larger hacking target? I mean, the more that we concentrate and create new targets, um, I think that's really where we expose ourselves to risk. So again. I'm totally open to it, but I think it needs to be vetted really by technical experts, technologists, and security researchers who know, who, who can play with it and see where the problems might be. Yes, right here. Oh, I think right in the front. Sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, so one of the things that you hit on was kind of the the false choice that's being made between you know security and, and privacy. <coughs> One of the key goals of the FTC is consumer protection. The chief complaint every year with the bullet is identity theft and stuff like that. With the DOJ going down this, this road, which seems mutually exclusive to the role of the FTC, how is the FTC engaging with the Department of Justice as they pursue something that seems antithetical to the mission of the FTC? Well. I'll say this, the FTC does not have a specific policy statement on encryption and encrypted communications. I'm speaking for myself. I think, generally speaking, there a, a lot of the discussion that you hear from the Department of Justice does relate to its authority to you know, investigate and enforce criminal law. The FTC is not a criminal law enforcement agency, but I think we do have some or at least several of us do feel that there is increasingly this false choice doesn't reflect today's market realities about why is it that firms or state and non-state actors are seeking to collect this information. I don't know if there's a full appreciation for why is it that foreign actors are seeking to know such detailed information about each and every single one of us. We have theses about are they doing it to in interfere with elections? Are they doing it to divide us? We have all sorts of hypotheses. But again, I think that's something that many criminal law enforcers, you hear it from other jurisdictions too. 
Um, so I hope that sort of sheds light on really maybe some of the differences. But you know, if there's going to be a debate again that we recycle from 20 years ago, you know, all of us should be part of that. Yes, over here. Uh, good afternoon, Dave Pereira from MLEX. Thanks so much for taking my question. I have a two-parter. I'm wondering if you can comment on some of the rhetoric that's been coming out of the Justice Department for the reasons for a backdoor. It's shifted from terrorism to child exploitation. So can you comment on the substance of the DOJ concerns regarding end-to-end -end <coughs> encryption and preventing the investigation of child exploitation, and also on this apparent shift of rhetoric invoking child exploitation? You know, um, thanks for the question. I can't speak to, you know, the rationale for why it's being done. I think, you know, look, it's important to engage with um, advocates and the communities that are concerned about child exploitation and, um, you know, crimes that go online. And I, I, I do think it's important. We should be honest with ourselves that maybe some of these investigations are tougher. Um, but again, the solution of making communications, um, you know, unencrypted, I don't, again, I don't know if that helps them. And in fact, there's been several studies about what are the impediments to sometimes unearth uh, some of these, it, it, where are the challenges in these investigations, and also, they often are outside of actually determining and decoding individual messages. But, uh, you know, I don't, I can't speak to the DOJ's um, thinking on this. Uh, this is a technical question, and I'm not technical, so pardon me, but is, I think I had read somewhere that there's a theoretical limit in, in terms of uh, encryption based on really big numbers that were originally presumed to be too big for computers to crack, and that presumption is no longer uh, current. Can, can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that the history of encryption is all based in, you know, cryptography, um, and it would require certain amounts of time or computing power to crack or decode messages. And as you have advances in computing power, it is possible that, you know, some things that were encrypted using an old type of crypt cryptography may be able to. Um, my, my understanding, and I'm not a mathematician or a cryptologist, but my understanding is that while, while, while there has been advancements, um, ultimately encryption will have sort of a time-tested ability to move to uh, more bits or longer strings so that um, it, can, it can reach those technical limitations. But I may not be the best uh, person to answer on that. Any last things? Any other questions? All right, Commissioner Chopra, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Alex.
All right, I want to thank the commissioner again for sharing some great insight into his position on encryption, and I'm very excited to continue talking through some of those threads with our fantastic panel, um, representing really all sides of the encryption debate. Uh, we have from the Hill, Asad Ramzanali. He is legislative director for uh, the office of Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. She is a California Democrat who represents parts of Silicon Valley. Uh, and she has also been outspoken in challenging uh, Attorney General Bill Barr's recent push for, uh, push against worm-proof encryption. Um, we have Kun Kim. He is Senior Managing Counsel of Digital Solutions for MasterCard. Uh, Katie McInnes, Policy Counsel for Consumer Reports. And Hannah Quay de la Vey, Senior Technologist at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Thank you all so much for, for joining today. Um, so one of the things that came up in our in our chat with Commissioner Chopra, um, is he mentioned you know, this idea of a recycled debate from decades ago. So we know that debates on encryption are not new. They really date back to the 1990s. Um, and Hannah, I was wondering if you could give us sort of the 10,000 foot view on how that debate took shape in the 90s and how it has evolved into the Trump era conversations that we're having today. Yeah, for sure. So, um, and the, the commissioner spoke about a bunch of this, so I will try not to rehash too much territory, but um, essentially, you know, it's quite similar to the debate we see today. There were discussions about, you know, as more and more of our lives sort of move into this online space, uh, law enforcement is quite concerned about losing access to evidence that they would need, and so they really pushed uh, both for backdoors and for just limitation of the adoption of encryption more generally, right? And that took the form um, in a lot of cases of export controls and classifying encryption even as, as munitions was actually something that we saw in that time as well. Um, and uh, there was a, a push to have either escrow or some sort of form of backdoor. And so that is what led to the introduction of the clipper chip, which is another thing that the commissioner mentioned. And what the clipper chip was, was a chip designed by the NSA uh, that would essentially allow law enforcement to maintain keys and have access to this. Um, and what ultimately happened with that was uh, there was a lot of pushback against it just for civil liberties reasons, for security reasons. Uh, but the sort of death knell of the Clipper chip really came when Matt Blaze um, just discovered that it would, would have been quite easily exploitable. Um, and so consequently, it really did undermine the security of the devices that it would have been embedded in. Um, and so what we actually saw was a sort of compromise here in the form of what's called CALEA, the Communications, nope, not going to remember what that acronym stands for. It's very embarrassing, but essentially, <laughs> Uh, it was a, a law that um, ensured that law enforcement would still have some access to the digital communications that were starting to become so predominant. Um, and that uh, required that um, telecommunications providers, so phone, um, could still use encryption, but they had to have some form of access for law enforcement. Um, and uh, CALEA has, has stood. It was amended in 2005. Uh, to incorporate email, but explicitly excluded this idea of information services. Um, and then one other thing I would comment on in terms of the evolution of the debate is for a very long time the debate essentially said, uh, well, we want backdoors, law enforcement's position was largely, uh, we want backdoors, but not at the expense of the overall security of the system. And that really gave rise to uh, the this, this security community, academics in the space, cryptographers saying, like, no can do, you know, like that's simply not possible. Um, and one evolution that I think is interesting is now it's much more a discussion of, well, what level of security are we willing to sacrifice in order to have this backdoor access, which on its face seems like a good evolution, right? Now we're starting to talk about a balancing act. Um, and part of the, the pushback and the concern there is sort of like, well, there isn't really a way. Like the, the sort of fundamental aspect of is this technically feasible still exists, right? There's not actually really a way to get 95% crypto or 98% crypto. It's a little bit of an all or nothing um, situation. So the rhetoric has evolved in some ways, but the actual sort of underlying technical questions haven't really. So it has come up a lot in the news recently, as, as someone, at, um, someone mentioned this in their question um, during the chat. It's come up a lot in the news recently um, for a couple of different reasons that we keep hearing about. 
One of them has been the administration pressuring Apple to give federal officials access to, to locked phones um, or to help them unscramble uh, encrypted communications, um, especially you know, after the recent mass shooting uh, in Florida in December. Another thing we've been hearing about a lot is about Facebook's Facebook standing firm on its plans to end-to-end -end encrypt its platforms, which the Justice Department has said um, will hamper its, its efforts to fight crimes like, like uh, child sexual abuse. But I want to move sort of outside of those hot button issues that we keep hearing about in the news and look at how society more broadly relies on encryption. Um, Katie, can you talk about how encryption applies to all consumers, how we use it in our day-to-day -day lives? Yeah, so most of you use encryption when you do some kind of protected messaging, either through your iPhone's message system or Signal, Telegram, WhatsApp. Uh, so you're already very much aware of it, but one area where it affects consumers a lot and they don't really think about is with security updates, to make sure that not only the security updates are validated and coming from the right sender, but also that, um, that your device is also recognizing that they're from the right sender. So that's a huge issue. And not only making sure that your device is protected now, but making sure that you're protected against future problems. Um, and another emergence, emerging issue with uh, encrypted communications and encrypted services generally is with connected cars. Um, our connected car system, or whether it's autonomous or partially autonomous, is going to deal and depend a lot on encrypted services um, to make sure that the not only the, kind of what I was just talking about with security updates, that those um, to and from messages are validated, but also that your communications within the car um, and your data that's stored on the car is encrypted also. But we, we depend on encrypted uh, services all the time for most of our consumer products. Um, which is one thing that comes up a lot in these right to repair conversations is we have a lot of connected products in our homes that are aging. Some of you guys might have seen the Sonos uh, news story about their legacy Sonos products and how they're ending some services for them and then they later retracted that, um, that stance. But whether or not you actually own your product and for how long you own this product and how long it'll work is uh, dependent on whether or not those encrypted software updates will continue coming through. I want to bring in Kun on this one too. Can you talk about how encryption plays a role in online transactions? Yeah, sure. Um, so, like, payments is just another area of our lives, our daily routine, where um, the experience is happening more and more digitally. Um, and, and I just want to make sure I, I unpack and kind of uh, talk a little bit about the scope and the context that I'm talking about when I say digitally. Um, there's, of course, the traditional sort of e-commerce, when you shop online, you shop, buy something at Amazon, that's a digital transaction from our perspective. Um, I, I bought a plane ticket online to come down to DC for this event, so that's an e-commerce digital transaction. When I arrived at DCA, I, I hailed a cab with Lyft. Um, even though the experience is completely in person, I'm face to face with the cab driver, and he's taking me physically from the airport to the hotel, that's also a digital transaction because they're using a credential that they've stored on file, online, uh, within their own environment, and using that to conduct, to create the payment uh, experience. Um, last week, I was, I was driving around and, and kind of hitting the bottom of the barrel in the gas tank, and I had forgotten my wallet. Um, luckily, I was able to download, it was a little bit of a cumbersome experience because it was my first time doing it, but I downloaded, um, the Exxon mobile app, I link it with Apple Pay, I had my card on there, and I was able to authorize the pump and, and transact and buy gas for my mechanical car digitally. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with payments, there, in every step of that transaction, there's a lot of entities sort of playing a role in order to facilitate the consumer being able to walk away from the transaction. There's the merchant, there's the issuer that's, paying, that's, um, that's issued your card, merchant has its own bank, there are terminal providers, the bank will have authentication, um, fraud monitoring services on the back end systems, um, and of course there's network involved in every step of the way. Um, when pay as payments move digitally, there are even more stakeholders that are kind of involved in the process. There are your digital wallet where you stored your credentials, there are card on file systems providers, there are checkout facilitators. Um, and from our perspective, from MasterCard's perspective, it's kind of our responsibility to ensure that the consumer experience is going to be secure. It's not only convenient and easy, but it's happening in a secure way. And every step of the journey, wherever that credential is sort of within the, the, uh, the, the participant systems, as well as when it's 
as well as when it's traveling between the systems, that it's happening in an encrypted and, and secure manner. Um, I think if I could just kind of give a little bit of a, uh, one example of how encryption has kind of evolved from in a, in a payments perspective. Um, everybody used to have the magnetic stripe card and you would just swipe it at the terminal to be insecure. Uh, payment systems evolved that to chip cards. So you stick a chip in the terminal. Um, that transaction is more, it, it uses encryption. It's encrypted, it's secure when it's on the card. It's also secure when it's being transmitted for payment in the, in the transaction flow. Um, we also then uh, use uh, contactless technologies so that we can transmit a, a secure payment, encrypted payment from a card to the terminal in a secure manner. Um, and hopefully it's better user experience rather than sticking the card into the slot and, and waiting for the approval. Um, and then we were able to use things like contactless to work with partners like Google and Apple and enable these really uh, amazing consumer experiences, paying with your watch, paying with your phone, paying with a wearable, um, uh, in again, the secure manner. Um, and, then, and then on top of all of that, we have a something called tokenization that we use. Um, that's also an encrypted technology that, that's based on an industry standard and we use that um, technology to store it securely within the digital wallet environment um, and facilitate a consumer transaction. So like kind of that sort of evolution of how we've used encryption and contactless sort of hand in hand, I think is a way of um, how, how security and convenience have sort of go hand in hand in this, in this area. So now that we have set the stage on some of these broader uses, I wanna get your reactions to something that the president told I want to get your reactions to something that the president told CNBC just a couple weeks ago. Here's what he said. If you're dealing with drug lords, if you're dealing with terrorists, and if you're dealing with murderers, I don't care. We have to find out what's going on. Um, where do each of you and your communities or organizations come down on this? Um, and how do you view the line between individuals' privacy and digital security on the one side and national security and public safety on the other? And Asad, we can start with you. Yeah. So. Um, I appreciate in the intro you said my boss has long been an advocate for uh, strong encryption and has fought against the idea of government backdoors. The analysis for her starts with these are questions of security and privacy first and foremost. I am not a computer scientist. Very few people on the Hill are. So that's where we should turn for the expertise. Uh, and it does seem like most of that community, as has been said, uh, has articulated that there's not a way to do a backdoor without weakening security for everybody. And so that's the frame within which we should start that analysis of how should we react to a comment like that or any other that, that raise the question of uh, encryption and how we should view government backdoors. Um, to us, everybody's security of communications and everybody's privacy is a big deal. We should care about that. We should advocate for stronger privacy and stronger cybersecurity. So that trade-off, as Commissioner Chopra, I think, articulated really well, um, that trade-off is something that we have to continue to monitor. But uh, until we can get to a spot where we realize there's just not a way to do it where, OK, fine, only in this instance will we uh, allow for backdoors. If we can't do that, then it's not a viable solution. Yeah, so that may be one way of framing the conversation. Another is to talk about local and state governments who lack the sufficient cybersecurity to protect their own systems from criminals who want to do ransomware attacks or other attacks that uh, not only compromise our own data as, as citizens or residents of that area or state, but also can disable an entire medical facility or a city governance system for days or weeks at a time. So uh, making sure that states and governments have the sufficient cybersecurity, first of all, to protect against those kinds of attacks, I think it's really paramount. Um, and to that end, there's the IoT Cybersecurity Bill of 2019, which is about government procurement of connected products and services, making sure that they are secure enough for use by the government. Um, so I think before looking to making our communication systems a little more insecure, we should be making sure that our government's communication services are secure in the first place and then talk about how best to go after uh, individuals or bad actors who may be um, doing these kinds of acts. But um, one great way of talking about uh, encryption by doors is comparing it to a locked physical door. If I, my own door is locked and I forgot my keys, that's easy. I can go get a locksmith and now I have new keys for my door. 
And encryption backdoors is like creating one key for every one store, uh, which we don't even do with our physical doors, much less our uh, connected products, which are much easier to um, get access to from one from behind my desk, which is going to every single person's home or um, device. Um, so I think that the conversation there is uh, unfortunately wrongly framed, and I um, uh, also end up on the side of Commissioner Chopra, thinking that they're going to be finding different ways of communicating anyways without our help, um, and that we should make our own security systems more insecure. Um, so I think from a private sector perspective, um, we would like to see this happen, however it nets out in a way that fosters innovation and competition. Um, the, it's, it's, I, think, I think more and more as consumers get better educated about privacy, encryption, uh, and how it impacts their personal security, um, they're looking for this in, in the companies and in the, in the services that they interact with. So it's from a, from a private sector perspective, it's becoming a, a point of innovation around how you kind of manage privacy and personal information, how you secure it, how you convey that experience to the consumers and, and really build trust with the consumers and, and earn their trust. Um, at the same time, I also, it, it, the, the bad guys, the fraudsters in the payments experiences, but um, terrorists and whomever, they're, they're like insanely sophisticated. <laughs> they w whatever, whatever technology, whether there's a backdoor or not, they find ways to pinpoint the vulnerabilities, find the weakest link, and really just, um, just attack it with, with, with incredible precision. So it's important, I think, to um, allow room for innovation because companies have to be able to uh, continue to improve and, and find new ways of encrypting and, and uh, bringing data ethics and, and security into how they deliver their products and solutions to consumers. Um, and if you, if you kind of over-rotate on the national security issue um, and, and create a kind of legacy sort of compatibility and things like that, it would, it would be, uh, I wouldn't want to see that kind of hamper the way that companies move forward and, and keep America uh, at the innovative forefront, at the forefront of innovation. Yeah, so I, in addition to agreeing with everything the other panelists have said, I would also say that uh, I think this framing of the debate that we have between you know, privacy on one hand and national security and physical safety on the other hand is not it's not the right framing, right? Um, national security certainly relies heavily on encryption, right? I mean, we, we know that uh, military officers use Signal, right? Uh, they're not building in-house tools for a lot of this, right? So the national security community hasn't been particularly um, pushing for, for exceptional access mechanisms. And certainly physical safety, you know, is, that is something that encryption can hugely impact, right? I mean, people keep themselves safe in the real world also by keeping themselves safe online, right? Communicating safely with people, uh, knowing that if you send your address to your best friend so they can find your house, that's not gonna end up, you're not gonna end up getting doxxed online by whatever hate group of the day is targeting you. Um, so even just the framing of privacy on one side and safety on the other just isn't, that doesn't hold up. Um, encryption is a critical safety tool for a large number of communities. Uh, and Hannah, I know this already came up uh, briefly, this idea that weakening encryption in one case might actually uh, be problematic for you know, other, other cases as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that from a technical perspective and whether there is a clear, viable technical solution? Yeah, so um, the, I think what people generally mean when they're talking about that is sort of the same fundamental algorithms underlie a lot of these systems. There's sort of there's two main classes of encryption we talk about. There's sort of um, on-device encryption, which is, you know, when you lock your iPhone, it's encrypted until you enter the password. And then there's the sort of in-transit encryption, which is if I send you a text message, nobody along the way is going to be able to read it. Um, and the, the algorithms that underlie those 
are, are pretty universal, right? I mean, your bank is using a very similar in transit algorithm to your, your text messages, right? And you know, there's a sort of a finite number of these algorithms that we've acknowledged are sufficiently strong, sufficiently secure. Um, and so introducing a vulnerability into one of those systems is going to propagate into all the other systems that are using the same technology. Um, and your question had a second half that I um, If there is a clear viable ah, right. technical solution. Um, and I think the answer to that right now is no. Um, and you can, you know, one of the, the questions for the commissioner was, you know, like is there, is there proof of that? And I think sort of the best proof of that is people have been trying, right? Like this conversation has been going on for almost 30 years. Um, and, you know, the NSA, which is an incredibly well-resourced both monetarily and uh, in terms of, you know, bright minds, tried to do this and failed, right? Um, and, I, and I think that there's this, this sense that, you know, the academic community, the technological community just isn't trying, right? They just dug their heels in. And that's not actually the reality. The reality is people have really tried and it just, we have yet to come up with a solution that has stood up to technical scrutiny. So um, currently, I think no, right? There just isn't a technical solution that provides us with the security that we would expect. And we can, of course, acknowledge that many of these law enforcement requests are perfectly legitimate and often really time sensitive. So, Kun, I was wondering if you could speak briefly about what sorts of processes are in place at a private company, for example, that allow a private entity to aid law enforcement when those legal requests are made. Uh, try. Um, so, so within our company at Mastercard, um, I, I, even before you get to the the point of like having to interact with law enforcement, um, we we we're, we're investing. We have invested a lot in making sure that we're able to number one identify um, identify and authenticate legitimate users as well as illegitimate users. Um, and then we invest in AI and other technologies to be able to detect some bad events from happening even before they start to happen. Kind of, you know, looking at um, be being able to sift through the data and and um, identify identify some events that might occur before they arise. When we do get a law enforcement request, um, I, I think that not to kind of belabor the point, but I think this is another point of innovation that companies have to continue to work on um, as, as cybersecurity becomes a, a hotter topic and debate nationally. Um, we, we've kind of transformed the way that we've, we address uh, cybersecurity events. Uh, it's not in a siloed way. It cuts across the organization between law, the law department, the technology department, the product department, the customer facing, the, uh, the relationship managers. Um, privacy, data teams, um, and, then, and then sort of a, a framework for open, uh, and, and we, we work on kind of the Hill and, and the other areas from a policy perspective to um, have ways of having open dialogue and, and transparency with law enforcement so that we're able to share information, share information between companies as well with our issuers and our merchants to identify precisely where the where the weak link in the chain is, um, and identify where the point of point of vulnerability was. Um, and I want to actually switch gears now to talk about the Hill. Um, so other parts of the world already have robust laws uh, in this area in place, and that has definitely turned the turned the heat up on Congress to do the same. Can you give us a sense for how the encryption debate is shaking out on the Hill, um, and how you are seeing members of Congress engage on the topic? Yeah. Um, so I think, so first I'll start with kind of the context within which a lot of this policy debate is happening. Uh, there, there's two parts to it. One which has been talked about is this is not a new debate. Uh, some members of Congress have positions that they've held in the past, uh, my boss included. Uh, but the other, other trend going on here is there's a broader tech clash. There's a broader discussion about the role of technology companies and technology in society and how policy should and should not be reacting to some of the harms that we see. Uh, my, one of the top priorities for my boss this year is privacy. Uh, she has a privacy bill with uh, Representative Lofgren, um, and we didn't, you know, we, we didn't try to do the minimal viable. We thought there's kind of a bigger need here. Uh, the reason for that, a lot of the parts of this tech clash, privacy is one part of it, um, we think they're pushing towards a world in which technology is less trusted 
and that's problematic. Uh, technology can be a good vector for society. Uh, tech can do a lot of good. Uh, but when people stop to trust it, it becomes problematic. And so that, that's where encryption to us also plays an important role. Um, it is kind of fascinating to see how much tech policy has gone from something people don't really discuss and is kind of a cousin to telecom policy uh, to front and center. Like the, the presidential nominees are talking about tech policy. Uh, so, so it is that that evolution is important and a lot of the problems being discussed as part of that discussion we should pay attention to, we should look for policy solutions, but that doesn't mean that uh, every single part of it, uh, every single part of the discussion on here's a problem in tech is one where we should react in the way that the kind of populace is saying. And this debate around encryption of we need government backdoors seems like one of those where you can have uh, emotions riled up and a quick reaction, but we'd rather step back and say, what's the right answer here? And beyond your office and beyond Congress, what other parts of the government have a stake in this and how are their reactions or their positions on encryption varied? I mean, I think we've talked about a lot of them. Uh, the DOJ, certainly, yes. um, law enforcement. Um, the intelligence community and national security, a lot of former heads of and leadership of the, of the agencies have actually come out and said, we're in favor of end-to-end -end encryption. We don't think a backdoor works here. And in fact, last year, I'm forgetting the name of the official, but it was a senior official from ODNI who said government officials should use end-to-end -end encrypted communications for unclassified communications. That's me texting other colleagues of mine, right? And that they're, they're telling us this is important, uh, yet on the other hand, another part of government is saying, uh, is kind of taking a shot at encryption. Beyond that, there's a consumer protection angle, which uh, Commissioner Chopra talked about. Uh, NIST plays an important role in the foundation of what uh, what the protocols look like and, how, and the evolution of encryption algorithms themselves. Uh, so there's, it's kind of a broad response, but where there's a security or a privacy nexus, I think there's some relationship to encryption. And you brought up the election briefly, um, and I wanted to get whoever wants to jump in on this one. Um, what do you think is the significance of encryption getting this heightened focus in an election year? And how would you say that this tech lash that you're talking about, this heightened scrutiny of the tech industry, is shaping or feeding into the encryption debate? I, I, I can start. I, um, so one angle is within the context of uh, a move towards privacy legislation. I'm hopeful that there's a move towards getting a privacy bill signed into law. Um, in that context, encryption does play a role. In our bill, we call out specific areas where encryption has uh, important roles to play. We try to incentivize companies using more encryption, not less. Uh, so that's kind of one niche part of it, where privacy is probably an important part of the tech policy conversation, and encryption is one uh, subset of that. Uh, more broadly, I think it will become, I, I think it will continue to rise up as we have instances like the DOJ calling for Facebook to stop encrypting, uh, its movements towards encryption of, of uh, messaging services, like the Apple scenario. So I, I hope it's not turned into like a hot button thing to toss around where every time there's an issue it turns into the proposed solution. Yeah, I think the conversations we've been having over the past few years about encryption and privacy and security have all been about to very flashy topics here at the federal level, but we're seeing the states really act on um, security in ways that the federal government has not been able to. We saw now all 50 states have data, data breach protection laws, uh, data breach notification laws, which the federal government has failed to do, but uh, your states in the meantime are working hard on your behalf, and even though that's not necessarily about encryption, that is one part of a data breach um, response. Um, and so that's great to see. And then you're also seeing, I mean, we're talking about a tech last year, which we're thinking about the big four or five tech companies, but I think a lot of people felt really, really, really burned by the Equifax data breach um, and just feel uh, a lot of fatigue that their, their information has been breached here again and again and again. We're seeing identity theft numbers are causing our economy lots of, uh, lots of money, taking individuals lots of time to protect themselves. And they're also using products on the market that may or may not be helpful at all. Um, as we saw with the conversations around uh, credit credit notification services as part of a response to a data breach. Um, so I think that consumers are generally feeling a lot, of, um, a lot of anger about how these products are not safe when they're on the market at all. Just the way your toaster shouldn't set your house on fire, you, the services you use shouldn't expose your data to the public either. 
Um, so I think that even though we're having these very exciting conversations here, I think for the average everyday consumer, they understand that my data got out in the world when it shouldn't have, or someone's looking at my kids in my home because the camera I'm using is insecure, and they don't really care about how that is done, whether it's encryption or some other method. Another thing that, sorry, another thing that Kun and Assad have um, both brought up uh, is, is trust and transparency. And Hannah, I, wanted, I want to hear from you about what role you think that trust and transparency play in this from a technical perspective. Um, yeah, so I, I think trust is sort of a funny question, right? Like, because we want to be able to use our technical services, Facebook, MasterCard, whatever, but that does involve an incredible amount of trust, which I think is what, you know, what Katie's talking about, is people are getting fatigued with the fact that like, there's really no option, right? Like trust is usually a thing that you can choose to trust or not, and that's not really the situation we're in. We're sort of like, if you want to live in this world, you're going to cede control to entities that you don't necessarily trust. Um, and so what I'm hopeful is that the debate, the encryption debate will begin to incorporate some of this idea that encryption is actually a technology that takes trust out of that equation a little bit. Um, so, you know, for instance, the, the whole concept of end-to-end -end encryption, right, like, is essentially that I don't have to trust that WhatsApp isn't going to do, look at my messages. I don't have to trust that they're going to do the right thing and not go snooping. I just know that they can't. Um, so I, I think that I'm, I'm hopeful that we will start to, to use this language about just like what can we do to lay a foundation so that we're not living in this world where like the power is sort of all in one place and the people who have to engage with the services aren't in a position to decide they trust or don't and they aren't in a position to decide I use it or I don't. Um, yeah. So I want to go down the line again and, and ask, what is an ideal policy framework for encryption that would balance all these different things? And if there's not one, how do we move in a direction towards one? So I don't, I don't know the answer to that, uh, to that question. But I, I will say where we are right now, uh, based on what security experts are telling us, based on what privacy advocates are telling us, uh, it does not seem to me that the higher level talking points of we need exceptional access, we need government backdoors. Um, th that doesn't seem like a good idea. So it's easy, of course it's easier to criticize rather than suggest the, the path forward here, right? But um, what's being put in front of us, it's easier to, to kind of say, no, that doesn't, we, we should fight against that. And that's kind of where my boss and Senator Wyden wrote to uh, Attorney General Barr in October saying, your push to stop Facebook from, from encrypting uh, Facebook Messenger and Instagram that's not good. That's not going to help us. That's not in the public interest. Um, so, yeah, it's, a, it's an easier answer to say, here's what's not a good idea. But I don't know that there is a great solving all problems or a silver bullet. But that's often true in public policy. Yeah, I, I likewise don't have a perfect uh, proposal. But, um, due in part because my job is to actually think about you and everyone else who are just using products every day um, and not to figure out how to stop crime. Um, but I do think that, right, anything that makes us all safer as a community should be preserved. Um, and I also think that, you know, I, the last, this current administration has a big focus on America first. We're the hub of innovation. We have all these amazing tech companies, and that's what makes us special and wonderful. I think that if we do have this kind of uh, encryption backdoor that's enforced on American companies, we're going to see that consumers go to foreign-based companies more often. Um, as a response to that, I don't think that's necessarily what uh, the administration would want. And I also don't think that it's what we as consumers would want, right? Like, I know where Apple's headquarters are. I see them in our congressional hearings. Facebook already doesn't go to hearings in other countries where they've been requested, but they come to ours at least. Um, so I think there's a, an important balancing act that has to happen here, too, with our own uh, tech companies and what we think uh, U.S. consumers should be looking towards. Um. I think, I think privacy and encryption obviously go hand in hand. Uh, encryption, would, encryption would kind of ask you how do you protect, how are you protecting the information that you've collected of me? Privacy, a privacy framework would kind of ask you um, do you even need the information that you're collecting from me? What's the purpose of the information that you're collecting from me? Um, and I think we would like to see from a, from a private sector perspective, um, I think there are four things. Uh, and, and a lot of it is addressed in, in 
Congressman Lesher's bill as well. Um, we're looking for, from a, from a private per sector perspective, um, a national standard, um, not kind of state by state, uh, it's, or, or even industry by industry, sector by sector, a national standard um, that kind of lays the, uh, raises the baseline a little bit, raises the sea level for minimum amount of security, how things might be addressed in a principled way so that companies can apply those principles um, that'll be specific to their individual sectors and, and develop solutions that are gonna be protective and security solutions that are gonna address the specific use cases that they have in mind. Um, another one, I've said this before, is, is just, it has to balance, uh, it has to foster innovation and competition. Um, something that's technology neutral, doesn't really, uh, it's, it's not about kind of addressing companies that operate in a specific kind of space or use a certain kind of technology. Um, but then kind of going back to the national standard, uh, enabling, enabling the private sector to innovate on, on kind of a, creating a baseline for, for innovation to happen on top of that. Um, from a privacy perspective, uh, as, a, as a company, we, we've kind of embraced the GDPR-like model where, where we say, as a consumer, um, you own your data, you control your data, um, we're gonna develop solutions to benefit you and we're gonna protect it. Uh, I guess the protect, that last port point is where encryption would come in. Um, and I, I think going back to the trust point from earlier, uh, as, as companies try, companies that are, I, I agree with you, <laughs> people will, people have a hard time kind of, um, there, there is, I think, a sense that you have to use some of these products and services in order to live in today's world. Um, and maybe they might not trust the entities that they're, they're working with. Um, I think that we're gonna continue to see a lot, of, lot more innovation in this space, a lot more thought leadership. Um, and and hopefully, hopefully technology companies will begin to earn that trust back from cons consumers. The last point, I think, is interoperability from a, from a framework perspective. Um, enabling for both privacy and, and encryption sides of the debate. Uh, um, just, just enabling, enabling, uh, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Enabling the uses and, and protection of data in an interoperable way so that if something bad does happen, companies will be able to address it regardless of what sector they're in. Um, and then, and then you, you look at the issue across, not just from a US perspective, but how do you work with companies and, and law enforcement and government agencies and, and others, uh, NGOs, et cetera, who are not operating in the United States and in Europe or Latin America or elsewhere. I, again, agree with everything that the panel has said already. Um, an, another, just from a sort of a policy question of how, what, balance we want to strike here, I guess, is the, the question we've been asking a lot. And I would really love a little bit more focus on like if we were to take encryption as sort of like we're not touching it, right, which is like obviously what I would like, <laughs> please leave it alone. Um, what, what would we do then, right? Like at that point, how would we support law enforcement? How would we support other arms of the government in, in continuing to do all the things that they need to do that fall in their mandate? Um, and, and I think that there's space there, right? I think a lot of companies do really excellent work about um, making what they can make accessible to law enforcement accessible, right? How are they, what kind of technical assistance are they providing? What does that process look like? I think the more that um, we can enable law enforcement to access what they have, what they can access, that they have a legal right to access, the better. Um, I think there's also room to, you know, there have been uh, pushes to, to sort of revive the, Office of Technical Support for Congress so that they can have a better concept of what they're working with, what are the, the you know, side effects of these policy decisions we're discussing, what are the knock-on effects 10 years down the road, sort of like really making sure we are resourcing that kind of support um, appropriately so that as the, the tech becomes ever more a part of our lives, our, our Congress people are, are able to legislate around that effectively and appropriately and in a way that doesn't have unintended consequences. So I, I would like to see us think more about beyond encryption, what are the ways that we can support um, a better framework for our government as far as technology goes? 
And I want to circle back, uh, and then we can, go to, we can go to some audience questions. I want to circle back on privacy legislation, since you've all brought that up. Um, hopefully this is something that uh, Congress will make headway on this year. If the DOJ uh, and the administration make headway on weakening encryption anytime before privacy legislation were to take effect, um, could be in the distant future, um, how would that affect, like, how, how would that affect privacy legislation and what sort of precedent um, would that set for other consumer privacy issues? And I know um, Commissioner Chopra touched briefly on this, uh, but would love to get your perspective as well, Asad. Um, so in the debate around privacy legislation and what provisions are going to be in uh, specific bills or what provisions people are going to fight for, encryption hasn't been a huge part of that conversation. Um, it has been kind of subsection C2, Roman numeral 1, of that debate. And that's unfortunate, but that might be an OK outcome for the conversation itself. Um, if the DOJ is able to go forward, I, I, I think they'd probably need congressional action for the kinds of things they're demanding to happen in a broader societal way. Uh, but, but if something like that was to go forward, then, then I think we've got a new set of policy problems, right? I think it's, yes, we need f uh, federal privacy pr uh, legislation, but we also need to figure out a more sound way of dealing with uh, encryption. I, I mean, really, the, the policy outcome here should be encouraging more encryption, right? It shouldn't just be stopping like the, the hammer on bad uses of backdoor suggestions. Uh, but uh, advancing that is, it's, it's harder to do, but that's where my mind goes. And if anything, addressing encryption remains really just a small footnote in larger privacy legislation, which you said could be a win in some way. Um, if it remains, though, a footnote like that, do you foresee any separate legislative action on encryption outside of federal privacy legislation? Yeah, I mean, there's rumors that there's bills floating around that deal with encryption. Um, uh, in, in ways that I think could be problematic, right? That, that we, we may not uh, uh, want to support, but um, I will be watching those closely. And, and certainly, you know, my boss's views on encryption have been long held, and, and I have not heard from her that she's changing her position on that anytime soon. So we would continue to advocate for uh, spreading more encryption. All right, and with that, I would love to hear if anyone has any questions. Yes, in the back. Thanks. A quick question. Um, as far as going to um, trade shows, if any of you do that, have you found that there have been more new encryption software being introduced than prior? Or have you covered most of the basis of things that can be done and trying to work in reverse? Because I've heard that encryption software in general can be a big pain in the butt if you don't know what you're doing. Try. Um, <laughs> there's there's certainly encryption, more and more encryption technologies that are coming out, um, and and in some ways it's it's using existing encryption technologies for new use cases, um, transporting things from one industry to another, uh, and in other ways, um, it's it's you sort of see. I can't speak to any specifics, but uh, I know that we are seeing some um, part of the ongoing kind of development and, and evolution in this space is companies trying to find new ways of encrypting and, and securing consumer information in a way that's innovative, in a way that um, maybe looks at things a little bit differently than they have been. Blockchain is, is an area where I think encryption um, we saw a lot of stuff about blockchain in the, in the news and, and coverage, la media coverage last year. And, and that's an area where encryption is a little bit more, um, it's probably a, a more at the forefront than it has been in, in other technologies. Uh, so companies are, and, and private sectors and NGOs and policymakers are kind of thinking about encryption and security um, and how it relates to new, new technologies and, and, and consumer use cases. Um, Product, but like Firefox, for instance, is now looking to encrypt the traffic to their DNS servers. And so encrypting some of the infrastructure on our internet 
outside of just HTTPS and uh, encrypting certain web pages, I think is a step forward. Uh, for those of you who engage in broadband privacy will remember that there was a uh, cybersecurity component of that broadband privacy rule that was rolled back. Um, so what's great is that we're seeing industry try to patch some of those uh, insecurities in their own systems as a way of making sure that consumers and also all traffic in general um, are more protected. But on the consumer front, we're seeing more interest in password managers and more engagement on the use of password managers and other tools to make sure that your own accounts are uh, better protected, but also just encrypting more of your private information. Um, and so that's one thing that we've seen. And I think that the, um, the market for privacy protecting components like password managers is only going to increase, especially if we have a continued tech lash or continued distrust with the tech system generally. And, and the one thing I'll add, so similarly, no, I, I'm not as up to date on the latest uh, vendors or, or specific software tools, but another area where, like I was saying earlier, we're trying to say there's need for more encryption is within telecommunications, uh, especially at the standards level as 5G, the, the panacea for all of society's problems, um, as that <laughs> kind of rolls out, um, there is a lot of discussion at the standards level of how encryption works within that. Now, we should also say, we need to do more about 4G, 3G, and 2G, and everywhere else your text messages and, and phone calls are going. But uh, it's important that that discussion is happening at the standards level. Yes. Hi. Uh, so I know there's been some discussion of encryption as a, a foreign policy issue and keeping American consumers on American tech platforms. I was wondering if the panel could speak to situations in which American consumers end up on foreign tech platforms. So two examples, just last year, uh, the viral face app. Um, the FBI said it's a possible Russian counterintelligence threat. And then you also have an app like TikTok, which is massively popular. And as far as we know, at best, the Chinese government has a backdoor. And at worst, they have a backdoor. And they're maybe censoring what Americans see on that platform. So what can or should be done with regards to encryption? in those situations when they're not even American companies, but there's a lot of American consumers on the platform. Yeah, no, go yeah, ahead. You go. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to weasel out of this a little bit um, to say that, you know, I think to some degree there is concern about, you know, restricting American companies' technology to restricting American companies' capability to really build out secure technology um, has a sort of twofold effect, right? I mean, the first one is this concern that you are going to get driven to platforms in other countries, which probably we're already seeing just because people like that app better, um, which is the case that you're talking about. But the way that I think it affects what you're talking about a little bit more is it, it does set a bit of a standard, right? Um, so the more I think that we normalize this idea that even in functioning democracies, the government should have access to basically whatever it wants, like that is a concerning norm to raise. And it, I think very much undercuts you know, the United States' ability to talk about what it means for a regime like China to have a backdoor into everything, right? To be able to really stand at a place where we can say we think that's repressive, we think that that uh, you know, it's bad for democracy. Like, I think that as we, if we continue down this road of saying, like, in a, in a democracy that's allowed, then we really lose the ability to argue against it in places where it, it has much more dire consequences. Um, and so I think that that enables things like TikTok to sort of not be such a big deal, right? And I think that's very concerning. And the other thing I'll say is, especially on the examples that you gave, but even more broadly, Encryption is one part of a broader kind of we need to be paying more attention to what's going on with tech, especially kids' use of tech. Um, so what, when I look at that, there's a number of kind of core consumer protection issues that are raised uh, that, that we need more information, that we need to be uh, studying more closely, privacy among them. Um, so to me, there's a, a number of questions there uh, that, that we should be paying attention to. Um, and, and we shouldn't just jump to like, is encryption the issue in that particular instance. It, it may well be, but uh, we're, we're, my starting point would be elsewhere, probably. Yes, right here. I was just making about 
um, the use of, well, the fact that we might be setting a norm and putting ourselves in a bad position, because it seems like it's not just related to um, you know, more authorita authoritarian regimes that are going down this road. We've seen laws in the UK and Australia and proposals in India and seeing some c conversation coming out of Europe about exceptional access as well. So I'm curious to know what the panel's thoughts are on you know, when our allies and people that are more um, aligned with us from a philosophical and political standpoint are going down this road, does that also contribute to that dynamic of establishing a, n a negative norm? And then I guess my next question would also be, I think the commissioner touched upon the difference between encryption for content versus metadata. And I'm just curious in the conversations that you guys are having, is that a distinction that's really uh, making its way into the, the discussion? Because there seems to be a distinction between law enforcement access to metadata um, or encrypted metadata versus access to encrypted content. So I guess I, I would say, uh, to the first point, like, yeah, I think absolutely um, other sort of our allies also kind of going down this path, I think, exacerbates that issue of just like this really is a norm that we're establishing in a way that I think is really is really harmful. Um, I think the question of metadata versus content, um, to me, a little bit ties into. I don't think it's worked its way into the debate so much because it is a little bit of a like wonky delineation because I think there's this there is a question of like what metadata, like I think that's another question that I, I would like to discuss a little bit more publicly about like what do we consider metadata and what metadata are we comfortable with being accessible to law enforcement or accessible to you know data sharing partners or whatever that may be. But I do think um, there's a little bit, and Katie may be able to speak more to this, but like a, a general consumer concept of the difference between like metadata and content, right? I think that is a line where actually most people have a pretty good intuitive sense of what that delineation means. And so to that sense, I, I think, yeah, that would be a, a helpful thing to push a little bit more on in the discussion. Um, I, think on, I think on the, 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 f the first point, um, we, are, we are seeing nationalism come up uh, in a lot of different countries around the world. It manifests in sort of different ways. Uh, sometimes it's about data, sometimes it's about just literally favoring the local local players in the local markets. Um, I, I think that from from my perspective, it, it it's, it's short sighted. Um, the <laughs> consumers, customers, are everybody's customers uh, travel globally. They transact globally. We socialize globally, um, and maybe maybe more importantly, the point is. The bad guys also work globally, um, and to kind of keep things siloed up in a in, in sort of national uh, single companies or, or like national regimes that aren't uh, able to interoperate with one another really limits everyone's ability to kind of fight against terrorism, fight uh, identify security threats, whether it's fraud or terrorism or other security threats, um, and. Yeah, I guess that's, that's the thing. Yeah, I'm not sure that if consumers have a good idea of what mat metadata is outside of like the serial context where they're like, oh, I do know that my phone's pinging off of different towers and that's some sort of data about my location at any point. Um, but I do think that right companies are viewing some of these exceptional access requests as um, different than others, right? Like if I want to get metadata from someone's Android phone, that's going to probably require a lot of money on uh, Google or whatever company's behalf to get all that information together for law enforcement. So I think the, the shifting of the burden about who's putting together the evidence also will be, a, I think, a helpful framing conversation and maybe enable more company pushback on national security or law enforcement requests for exceptional um, access. Uh, but I think consumers more and more are realizing that any kind of data around them even if it's anonymized or meta, can say a lot about their personal activities, more, more information about their activities than perhaps their spouse or children or partner knows. Um, so I think that consumers are catching up much faster than we generally give them credit for, um, especially when you know, we can put it easily in context of like we saw that your phone was at 14th and K earlier today because you went to work. Um, so. Uh, 
thanks so much for joining us. I know that everyone is in this room because we think this is really current and important, and I'm wondering, as a question for all the panelists, if you might be able to tell us something you find really concerning right now in the encryption debate, and maybe something that you find hopeful. Um, so my concerning concern is um, the life, the life uh, time of all the connected Protestant services that we've introduced into our lives and attached to our homes and made part of our cars. Um, things like thermostats in your home used to not be uh, replaced ever, maybe when you sold the home or something like that. And then now it's going to maybe, you know, maybe Nest will uh, in services for some legacy products in like five years. And that's going to participate precipitate a lot of uh, recognition of device support periods. But every connected device you have has an expiration date. You just don't know it. Um, and the security of the content on that uh, device is going hand in hand with whether or not there's uh, security updates in the future. So that's my concern. But my hope is uh, connected to that too because we had um, a few presidential candidates actually speak on this issue, partially thanks to Iowa. Thank you, Iowa because farmers are very, very upset that they can't repair uh, their tractors that was a endlessly repairable item for generations, just like your car. And then now there's, uh, there's you know, contracts and uh, you know, companies that limits on whether or not you can repair this item that you bought, you own, and was more expensive than before, and yet now you can't repair it. Um, so I'm excited that this is entering, entering the conversation. We also have like 20 plus states who are looking at right to repair laws. So. Um, hopefully, we can start to change the uh, attitudes and the, um, the content around this. Um, yeah, I, so first I'll add that that was the first non-ironic uh, thank you, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've heard in at least 24 hours. Um, the, uh, the concern I have is the reason uh, this conversation keeps coming up periodically is uh, poorly thought through ideas, uh, in this case from the DOJ, are put forth and there's kind of a, uh, and I appreciate the work of New America and, and Consumer Reports, everybody here, uh, of saying, no, we need to convene and talk about this again. That, that's a useful reaction, uh, but it seems like this is just a repetitive debate over time. Um, so in a way that, that's frustrating. Um, I'm hopeful that, or what gives me some degree of hope is that there are companies that are pushing forward on their own. Firefox is a good example uh, of DNS over HTTPS. Um, F Facebook rolling out uh, encryption to its messaging apps. I, I think Commissioner Chopra is right to say we should interrogate the motives and uh, what the implications for their business models might be that might have other harms uh, for competition or consumers. But these are in and of themselves good moves uh, that I think are good for consumers. Um, I think maybe more a point of frustration rather than concern is um, the, the conversation often tends to be about like specific actors or bad actors. Um, and, and you focus on a particular company or a particular technology. And it, it sort of clouds the issue in my mind. Um, I think encryption, a, a robust sort of cybersecurity, privacy encryption framework could do a lot of good for, uh, to bring like social improvement, economic development. Um, it helps the national security from, from a national security perspective, but kind of focusing on, on just um, specific use cases, uh, we tend to just kind of talk about things that have gone wrong rather than about how we can fix it. I think a point of hope is maybe that um, companies are taking the initiative, as Asad just mentioned, uh, some companies are taking the initiative to to maybe rise above the fray, be, be more de ethical about their data usage, um, and and be be more uh, upfront and even transparent to consumers about about not just not not just how they what data they collect and how they use it, but how they protect it so that consumers can make informed choices. Yeah, I think so. A, a point of concern is maybe a deeper version of the, the sort of muddling of the debate of it generally gets talked about in very extreme ways about, you know, bad actors. And, and I think also just a, um, I think that the debate is often happening without all of the context and facts that we would like to have behind it, right? So I think, you know, particularly there's been a lot of frustration with the DOJ 
um, you know, not willing to talk about the number of phones that they're actually having trouble with and not willing to expose, like, how, how do these encrypted communications impact your investigations, right? Which I think make, just makes it, you know, we're having a discussion with half the information on the table and that I don't think that that's a recipe for a really effective, viable solution. Uh, so that's something I would really like to see change. I think something I'm, I'm hopeful about is that, you know, yeah, I think a lot more people are coming to the table to talk about this. Like, and I think we're seeing that in the way that presidential candidates are discussing it and that, you know, there is a push to move it into different, different areas of discussion, right? We're talking about, you know, the security of you using the internet generally, the ability to repair your tractor, um, you know, the ability for marginalized groups to stay safe in the real world. Like these are all voices that weren't necessarily as present as we would have liked in the debate that are really starting to rise up and engage and talk about how this really is bedrock technology. Yes, in the front. Um, as reported by Politico and, and a couple others, uh, there's a bill on the Hill right now from Senator Graham, some are calling it, uh, Tech Room called it a backdoor to a backdoor. And the argument is rather than having the government saying, you may not use encryption or you must create a backdoor, they're saying, if you have encryption and bad stuff happens, you're liable. Are you, is, is that kind of just the same thing in different phrasing or are you seeing a fundamental difference between the government saying you must do this or you will be liable if you encrypt and bad stuff happens? I think it's the same thing. I don't think that's an appreciable difference. Um, and that, you know, it, CDT has, has written about about the Graham bill and made our feelings on it quite clear, but I, yeah, I think it it's not helpful to say, well, you don't have to follow these rules, we'll just make you criminally liable if you don't. Like that is, that's legal action. Hi, thanks. Um, so I think you all have made a lot of really good points with respect to the state of things, which is, it's kind of muddy. Um, you have very polarized issues, at least people's views on them. Um, it's also really confusing for consumers and for companies who want to do the right thing. Um, it's kind of this push-pull. It's like you, you want to do the right thing and protect people's privacy, but as soon as you do that, you get banged on the head by, um, by law enforcement. Um, as you said, law enforcement has been kind of um, beating this horse for many, many, many years. Their motivation might change, whether it's terrorism, whether it's you know, child protection. Um, but it, while I really like what you're saying, Hannah, in terms of like there's a lot more people having the conversation, but at the same time, it still feels really zero sum still. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how can we create an environment where um, we can bring entities like DOJ to the table, um, bring privacy advocates to the table, um, bring encry encryption advocates to the table, and actually try and work towards um, the same goal maybe not necessarily giving up something that is important to you, but being able to actually be constructive in a conversation because there's lots of indications that people want to do that but not a whole lot of action to actually show that that's the case. <laughs> you guys are asking such good questions. Um, I, I think that at least sort of my feeling about it is that I think part of it is gonna be just <coughs> raising the issue up the flagpole in enough places that all of the people, all of the parties with different incentives have sufficient incentive to come to the table and I don't know that that's quite happened yet um, because I think, you know, there, there is still very much a sense that we talk about encryption as people have mentioned in the context of terrorism, child exploitation, bad actors doing bad things. And while that is still the primary, day, the, the loudest discussion we hear, there's just not a good way to have the conversation when you're only looking at this very narrow part of it. Um, so I, I guess I think an, an instrumental part of bringing enough people to like an actual discussion table as opposed to a sort of like media conversation table will be just putting out more viewpoints, broader viewpoints, viewpoints from different people that make the debate nuanced enough that people are incentivized to actually come to more of a negotiating table. 
I don't have a great path to how that happens, but that's sort of my, my long-term <laughs> pie-in-the-sky feelings about it. The one thing I'd add to that, I, I think all of that I'd focus on, especially the problem side of the equation. It feels like sometimes there is a, here is a solution, and how do we motivate out the best possible hook to get at uh, government backdoors. Uh, whatever problem sets there are that we want to grapple with, and all the ones we've talked about are critical. They're, they're extremely important. Um, we should start with what's the problem space, what are the policy solutions, is this the one that makes most sense, rather than jumping to here's a specific idea and then reasoning out to what's, it seems at times what's going on is reasoning out to what's a hook that'll get people to pay attention. I have a quick question. How much is the how much influence is the Facebook uh, Oversight Committee going to have over Facebook and WhatsApp? They're rolling that out in a couple weeks. So you you mean the the Facebook Oversight Board that will play a role in their content moderation decisions? Okay, I'm I'm mostly familiar with it as far as the content moderation aspect goes, which I think is a little less than. It, <coughs> impacted by the encryption debate um, just because it's largely dealing with public or semi-public content, uh, but I don't know if people That's my understanding as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in that sense, it's a slightly different issue, but um, yeah, if they end up dealing with metadata, that will be a very interesting evolution of that discussion, I think. Hi. Um, I wanted to jump back as uh, Asad and Katie are here that um, kind of tangentially related to encryption but came up. Um, TikTok, uh, the face apps that are from other governments. I guess my concern is that people don't care. Like the encryption <laughs> community cares and, and the privacy advocates care and you know the, the national security folks care, but the average consumer would rather have the face app than worry about where is my face going? What database is my face going into? Like, should we be doing something about, is there anything we can be doing about that? Do you have any thoughts on, should we make them care or should we just protect the average consumer from it or? <laughs> so I, I think that's part of the job of a policymaker, right? Is to think about the areas where a consumer decision may not weigh in all of the risks associated. Um, I, I mean, I, that is an example of a market failure, right, where a consumer may not be deciding on that variable, but it is, in fact, an important one. Um, a, a prime example that my boss recently worked on is uh, YouTube channels that advertise uh, specific commercial things to children without disclosing or following all the existing laws and, and regulations around that. Um, certainly, kids watching these channels are not going to complain that they didn't know that the YouTube star was getting paid off of it. But we do know that that's an important consumer function of just disclosure and knowing where the dollars are moving. Um, so I, I'd argue that that, you're, you, I think you're right that most people using TikToks are not sitting there thinking about geopolitics and the national security implications. Uh, but that's our job. Yeah, my, my basic perspective is that the consumer should be protected even if they're gonna be reckless in their use of the product. Um, just like when you drive a car, you should have seat belts and airbags just in case you ram into a wall, um, so should apps be protected against you uploading your face to whatever app you recently downloaded and didn't look at any reviews or the privacy policy or anyone else's articles on it. Um, but I think this is another great reason to go back to a point that I saw made earlier is that uh, this is an area where we look to parents for a lot of oversight for children and their use of these apps. Obviously, TikTok is a huge, huge children's use product. Um, and I think that that's also a, a hard thing for us to square going forward, right? Because parents increasingly don't have the time or bandwidth to look at every YouTube video that their kid is watching. Um, and yet, that's the way we've structured um, a lot of our, a lot of the, the COPPA, the, the COPPA rules is that it's based on parents and the companies are also looking at parents to report um, instead of using uh, over, increased oversight on their own behalf. Um, so I, I look to companies and I look to regulators um, to protect children and consumers first. 
and then we can look to educating them or informing them about other issues. Hi, I'd like to thank the panel uh, for being here. Um, because this conversation has been kind of kept at the law enforcement and bad foreign government level, um, I think there has been, you know, the standards bodies have been moving in certain directions because of that uh, over the last 20 years. Um, so that's led to some unintended consequences that are affecting private companies uh, who have, you know, especially those with custodial uh, duties to customer data. Uh, they, they should be protecting that data. They want to protect that data. Um, but because of the standards bodies moving in a particular direction, it makes it harder for uh, companies to have visibility on their own networks uh, at certain moments. I mean, we've been saying for a long time that if you're either a company that uh, <coughs> has been hacked or you don't know you've been hacked. And so there's you know, bad actors who are moving around uh, these networks laterally, uh, whether they're going after customer data, whether they're trying to turn off the electrical grid, what, whatever they're trying to do, they're trying to do it uh, in ways where they can't be caught. And when there's a lack of visibility inside of your network, you have, you know, there's, they're gonna, bad actors are going to exploit that. Um, so, I, you know, it's not really a question, but, you know, I just have this concern because it's been kept at this bad, bad foreign government law enforcement level that we're kind of, you know, missing some of the real risks that, you know, that are gonna be outcomes of this if, you know, there isn't a, ri a right balance struck here, um, which we had 20 years ago, but with like TLS 1.3, um, where forward secrecy is imposed on you, you don't have a choice about it, you don't really have the ability to um, kind of tweak the controls as what's appropriate for the risk in within your networking environment. Hey, um, so gun rights activists have been arguing for years that we can't ban guns or we can't make access to guns harder because you're only going to negatively affect the uh, like good guy gun owner and you're just and bad guys will always find ways to get access to guns. Why is the similar argument with encryption not catching on as much, which is we've already heard before, you know, bad guys will still know how to encrypt their content um, and you're only going to affect negatively the like good guy citizen who is trying to protect themselves against the government. Well, I would say one reason is a little bit of the power of the pulpit, right? Uh, you have a huge uh, voice talking about how encryption is preventing them from getting those bad guys. Um, and so I think that that's one, one method for the framing. I also think that we have the blessing of living in a country that we see as non-authoritarian. And so we haven't been looking to our government as the barrier to our access of necessary human rights or resources. Uh, the way you might in another country where you need a VPN to access some of those issues, some of those uh, necessary services or to connect with a community that's interested in um, activism within your country. Um, so I think that's one reason uh, but another, I think another reason is, is that those conversations as we've been talking about are, have been going on for 30 years and so therefore a little antiquated. Uh, we're talking about encryption as a way of letting or allowing criminals to get away with conspiring or coming up with a crime. Uh, but we're not talking about how encryption is necessary. So I know that you, Eric, texted me today and not some other person telling me to come outside right now. Right, like that's a physical safety issue that we're not talking about just because that's what a one-on-one -on -one issue. And also that's just, people don't see that as encryption because they're not aware of the backend services on the devices. I think we have time for one more, yeah. So this question is mainly for Assad. Uh, you were talking about in the context of uh, consumer privacy legislation how you know, encryption could be relevant but it's not really part of the, the real conversation or the legislation. But when I think about it further, I mean the kind of, we want to promote strong encryption, that's one of the ways that uh, companies can protect their consumers' data. But what we're really talking about in terms of legislation is you know, avoiding a mandate for encryption back doors. So I don't know, were you thinking that there might be a role to affirmatively say, you can't have a mandate for encryption backdoors, and there have been bills, you know, freestanding bills introduced to do that, or did you have further thoughts on something 
separate and apart from the politics of whether it would sink the legislation of what might be an appropriate inclusion in the consumer privacy context on encryption. Yeah, um, where encryption plays a role in, in our privacy bill, and I won't speak for the, the myriad others, but um, in ours, we recognize the, role, the, the real limitations that companies might have with uh, encrypted data. So there's kind of a broad agreement that um, a consumer's right to correct data should be part of uh, privacy legislation. We, we have that as part of our bill. That becomes hard if the data itself is encrypted in a way that the company can't decrypt. Um, and so we recognize that limitation. Uh, in other parts of the bill, we do encourage that companies do encrypt in a way that they themselves can't decrypt. Um, and we have other, we've defined it as kind of privacy preserving technologies. Encryption is one part of that. Um, we, we try to incent that by saying, okay, if you're doing that, then you have a different standard for notice and consent. So we try to encourage it. We don't get into the question of backdoors in specific, and I don't know that others have. Um, I don't think anyone else is, but that's how we approach it is encryption is actually linked to privacy in our minds. It's just we haven't seen that in the debate. That's not part of the, the top level conversation folks are having about it. All right, and with that, I want to thank you all for coming today. Thank our wonderful panelists, and thank New America. Thank you.